everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, April 29th. Well, our girl Lauren went right over the edge this week. She figuratively drove her little BMW convertible right over the edge of the cliff. She did not look both ways. She did not stop to have a moment to reflect. She just stepped on the gas and sailed right over the edge of insanity. <laughs> it was entertaining though. I have enjoyed Lauren a lot this week. I've enjoyed seeing more of Lauren this week. And there's a part of me that can't help but identify with her. I feel in some ways that I, I can't really blame her for doing what she did. Lauren is just trying to go about her life. She's having a nice day at work there with Jill, just probably doing some inventory, dressing some mo dressing some dummies. <laughs> when Daisy walks in off the street with her smug attitude, her sneer on her face, the evil sparkle in her eye, and she starts taunting Lauren. She has this check in her hand saying that she's received a donation from some, um, I don't know, some church fund to go get some clothes for, I assume, her and her child, and she has to make a point of letting Lauren and Jill know that she has a right to to be there. It's, she, I mean, she probably could have gone at any, she could have shopped online, she could have gone at any other point in the day, but no, Daisy clearly wanted to be there when Lauren was there just to twist the knife a little bit. And I, I'm sorry, but Daisy was asking for it. What does she expect? In fact, maybe Daisy got exactly what she wanted. Maybe she was hoping to push Lauren over the edge in this way to make her look bad. She's standing there baiting Lauren, and Daisy knew exactly what she was doing now that I think about it. I think that's exactly the case. She was not only just ugh, in her way, in her Daisy-like way, torturing Lauren personally, but then Daisy has to go and start talking about Fen saying things like, oh, the last time I saw Fen, oh, he looked so cute running around the playground with his friends, implying that she's been watching Fen. And Daisy even said, now that I think about it, I haven't seen him around lately. And Lauren's just struck. Right? She has this moment of realizing that not only is this about me, but it really is about my child. Daisy has been watching my child, and this just sets Lauren off. It was that moment. It was Fen's name passing across Daisy's lips that sent Lauren over the edge. And I can't blame her. The only thing that I think I would have done differently, honestly, is Lauren should have <laughs> just calmly and quietly asked those two other customers that were in the store. There was only like two other people in the store. She should have just said, you know, we're closed. I need you to leave now. She should have quietly got them, ushered them out of the store, and then taken Daisy into the back room, <laughs> pretended like she was going to show her some clothes, go along with the little ruse, and then when no one was looking, she should have grabbed Daisy by her hair, jammed that gun into Daisy's ribs, and let her know that the next time Fen's name even passes through her lips, Daisy's going to be wearing a blood blouse. That's what I would have done. <laughs> Subtlety, you see, is the key. <laughs> but no, old girl had to get out her gun and start wielding it around like a maniac in the middle of her public department store with customers there. That was the mistake she made, because if the customers weren't there, she could have denied it. It's the fact that there were witnesses that really, really screwed her. So, I mean, I'm all for Lauren having a gun. <laughs> I totally understand where she's coming from and wanting to protect herself from the psychopath. I mean, we even saw flashbacks from 
years ago when Daisy was holding Lauren in that cage and just saying to her, you robbed us of a childhood that we should have had because our mother was obsessed with getting back with you and now I'm going to rob you of everything that's good in your life. So we flashed back to how evil and horrible that situation and tortured that situation really was and I, I feel like I understand why Lauren wanted to protect herself from this person. I understand why Lauren needed to get a gun. It's, it's only that she did not think the situation through. She did not have a calm and collected response. Instead, she just went a little crazy. And it is a seriously good thing for her that her husband is a lawyer. Otherwise, she would be in way more deep doo-doo. She would have been, and that she's rich, of course. I mean, she would have spent more than one night in prison. She would have not been arraigned nearly as quickly if she hadn't had uh, her husband on the case immediately. And also, um, it doesn't help, or it doesn't hurt <laughs> that Lauren takes a stunning mugshot. <laughs> I am so glad that she was able to have a sequined or a shiny, um, a sparkling top on for her mugshot. And of course, her hair is perfection. <laughs> now turn to the left. Now turn to the right. <laughs> play up the mugshot a little bit more. I mean, in the morning when uh, Lauren's mugshot hits the papers, everybody's gonna be just opening up like, oh, she looks stunning. No one's gonna care what she did. The, the, nobody's gonna care about the gun charges. That's gonna be like, oh, she looked good. <laughs> Oh, it is entertaining. It is, it is some, it's given me some comedic license here. But, you know, I, I also feel really bad for her now. She lost her mind and now she's stuck with the consequences of what she did. And it's very lucky for her <clears throat> that she has a really good support system around her. I, I, I don't want to go without saying that, <clears throat> pardon me. I'm really glad that Jill is there for her now. They've The two sisters have had their contentious points, but I'm glad that Jill is being there for her. And I, I'm really glad that Jill was there at the time when the whole thing happened because Jill got to witness how Daisy was acting. If Jill hadn't have been there and really saw the situation and seen the subtle way that Daisy was baiting Lauren, then I think it would have made Lauren look even more crazy, just and even more justified. It would have just been Lauren's word against Daisy's. So I'm glad that Jill was there to at least witness the situation and kind of help to cushion the blow a little bit with Michael, help explain what the situation was, because it really, it's, uh, Lauren said, you know, uh, late in the week, I don't think anything is ever going to be the same again, and I think she is very, very right. I'm just hoping that this whole situation is not going to cause her to, like, lose custody of Fen or, you know, be declared a danger to Fen or whatever. I, I hope that it doesn't result, I hope that her instinct to want to protect her son doesn't result in her losing her son. That would be horrible. But, I mean, at the same time, she messed up. She really, really messed up. She not only did, she did the wrong thing at a couple of points along the road because she really should have told Michael how she was feeling from the beginning. I think that part of the reason why their relationship has always worked really well is because they've always been very honest with each other. They communicate at all points along the way and instead of talking to him about how she was feeling, she chose to keep the gun from him, which is it's just such a mistake because I think she didn't want to tell Michael because she felt like he was going to get all reasonable, reasonable with her and he was going to try to rationalize with her and get her to not have the gun and she didn't want to hear that. She wanted to protect herself and at any cost protect her son and it's, it's just it's really quite unfortunate because Michael's reason is what helps balance her out. He could have saved her from this whole mess and instead she just made it worse going off on her own and worse for herself and worse for her marriage because when Michael found out that he was the only one that didn't know about the gun, he was very, very hurt. He could kind of accept
except that Jill knew about the gun because it's Lauren's sister. They're not, you know, he's not particularly close. He felt like, okay, I can deal with that. But when he found out that Phyllis knew about Lauren having a gun, he was really, really mad at her. He felt so betrayed, which uh, I, I don't know. I feel like Phyllis was both of their friends. Yes, Phyllis, pro if Phyllis felt that Lauren was about to, if Phyllis could have foreseen what Lauren was about to do, then yeah, I'm sure in retrospect she would have gone back and told Michael, but at the same time, that's a difficult situation for Phyllis, being caught in between two of her friends. And Lauren confided and Phyllis about the gun. So Phyllis really didn't have license to go ahead and blurt that out to Michael. So I can understand really where Phyllis was coming from in that situation, but I also know that Michael was just overwhelmed. He was the only one that was in the dark. He was not expecting this whole situation to happen. Now on top of everything else that he's got going on in his life, he is dealing with this huge situation, just blowing up with his wife. It is not looking good. It, it was they were almost, uh, Lauren and Michael were almost back on track this week. They were talking about how they were going to go up to Canada, bring Finn back, and just go on with their lives. And that's when she <laughs> pulled this stunt. And I really think <laughs> that forces beyond my control are really pushing Michael and Avery together. Avery is being there for Michael, which is good. I'm really glad that he has somebody he can confide in, somebody that he can lean on, considering the fact that Michael is always there for everyone else, and no one's ever there for him, and it's nice to see Avery there for him. I just wish it was going to be more of a friendship thing. I don't know. I, I, I just, I, Michael and Lauren have been my favorite couple for so long. I, you know, I, I just don't want anybody to break them up. So I, I feel that Michael and Avery are coming together. I worry that they're going to start bonding more and more over their anger toward Phyllis and just in general feeling despondent and that that's what's going to end up having them crash together in a romantic way. I just can't even imagine Michael kissing anyone but Lauren at this point. I can't imagine him showing up at parties with anyone but Lauren at this point. So it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because on the one hand I really, I, I love Michael and Lauren together, they're my couple, but, you know, in another way, I am glad that we're seeing more of them. I probably would have preferred to see them on screen in a different kind of way. I would rather it not have been turmoil in their relationship, and, and of course, I prefer a strong, independent Lauren to tortured and, and, and uh, slightly off balance. Lauren, probably more than slightly off balance, but you know, it's so it's it's kind of like a little bit of a mixed bag. I I I have to tell you guys, there was a scene after all this had gone down with Lauren at the coffee house where Michael was opening up to Avery and he could not hold it in any longer and he just broke down and started crying. And ugh, seeing Michael cry, it just it just does me in. I it's 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 so rare. He's always so strong for everyone else and just seeing him lose it made me lose it. It was very tender. It was very moving. Michael is not having a good time right now. He's really struggling cuz on top of all of this that's going on with his wife. Mm. He lost his job. His main client, Victor straight up fired Michael this week. I knew it was coming. Oh, I knew it was coming. Victor is very concerned about the SEC snooping around this beauty of nature deal. And Victor had a couple of contacts at the SEC. This is so wrong. Like morally, I should be so mad at Victor for this, that he was just going to circumvent the law and go to his contacts at the SEC and just 
have them hope, sweep the whole issue under the table and and try to prevent an investigation. He, you know, he did give Michael two chances though. First, he gave Michael the phone number of a guy that was kind of lower on the totem pole at the SEC. He told Michael to call him, and Michael just didn't do it. He just didn't have time. He didn't do it. And then Victor learned that it was escalating. So now he had to call in a bigger favor from a bigger guy at the SEC and gave Michael that phone number. And Michael ended up just from everything going on in his life lost the phone number, didn't make the phone call, and now the SEC, the agents are swarming. They're starting to ask questions. And Victor was so angry with Michael. I, I He yelled at him. He was, I, I don't think I've ever seen Victor be so angry with Michael. But then again, I don't think I've ever seen Michael let Victor down like this before. Victor was pissed. He was yelling like, I have lost millions because of this. Millions! <laughs> Which I have to say would piss me off too. <laughs> if I lost millions because somebody didn't, one of my employees didn't make a phone call that I asked him to make twice, I would be pissed off about it too. Oh, but it was just very telling because in a way, for the first time, rather than treating Michael like this, ma his magic um, ace up his sleeve, Victor was kind of treating Michael more like a son, treating him more like he has treated Nick and Adam, yelling at him just, and you could tell that Michael felt so ashamed. It was very, very hard, and, and you could also tell that Victor was struggling with it, that Victor didn't want to fire Michael, but felt like he had to. I don't know if to make a point or what, but I I just hope, I just hope Michael has been saving up those Newman paychecks for the last several years, because he's going to need them now that he's out of a job. Although, I really wouldn't be surprised if Victor rehired Michael once he found out what was going on in his life. Like, as soon as Victor gets tomorrow's Genoa City Chronicle <laughs> and on the front page Lauren is mm, striking a pose, maybe Victor <laughs> will decide to be a little forgiving and hire Michael back. I mean, because you gotta cut the guy a little bit of slack. Michael does everything for everyone. Anytime Victor needs him, Michael has dropped anything that was going on in his personal life to be there for Victor and his family. And everybody in Genoa City, Michael's always there for him. So what do you expect when, so, when everyone leans on him all the time? Everyone, sooner or later, that guy is going to break. Yes, so because Michael didn't make that SEC phone call, the feds have started to descend upon Genoa City, asking all kinds of questions. They went to visit Jack, they went to visit Victor, <clears throat> and now next week they're going to start putting the pressure on Genevieve. And it seems like their angle is... <sighs> like trying to question the or the validity of the original sale of Beauty of Nature when Adam sold the company and Genevieve bought it. And I think that personally it seems like the original sale was legitimate. Adam had the authority, I mean from Newman's perspective, Adam had the authority as CEO of Newman to put the <clears throat> business up for sale. The board voted on it. So from that perspective, I don't think Newman did anything wrong. If anyone is fishy here, it's Genevieve. A, where did she get the money to buy it? We all know that she went around draining Colin's bank accounts for uh, before he left town to get that money, which Colin's money is very, very suspect. I mean, he's in jail for and been indicted for his crimes. I'm sure his assets have been seized, so I wouldn't be at all surprised if that was the way she ended up eventually going down. But B, there's also the <clears throat> very obvious issue of the fact that she looked at Jack's bid. Jack showed her his bid for the company in confidence as his fiance, and she used that inside information to turn around, make sure that her bid was higher, and buy Beauty of Nature. It's got to be illegal. I'm not a legal expert. <laughs> but if I had to take a guess, I would say that that is illegal. And I think next week we're going to see the feds really, really pressuring her trying to get information from her. The only thing, actually, that might save her 
is that she has had a little bit of foresight. She had, she did get a little bit of a heads up realizing that the SEC might be coming after her. So she decides to go to Tucker and asks him to lie for her. She, since they're old buddies, she asks him if when the SEC comes to question her and eventually Tucker, if he would, mm, this is ridiculous, if he would say that he lent Genevieve all of that money, he lent it to her and didn't ask why. So like, because they're so close, this is what the feds are supposed to believe, they're so close that Genevieve goes to Tucker, asks to borrow millions possibly billions of dollars to buy, but, but doesn't, but it just lends, she wants it to be lent to her, and Tucker doesn't ask why. It's kind of ridiculous, but it's going to keep Tucker's hands clean as well, so I imagine if they both stick to their lie, they should be able to get out of that particular problem, and what Tucker is going to get in return is a portion of the sale of Beauty of Nature. So when Genevieve sells the company to Victor, Tucker's going to get a kickback because of it. Which, I I don't know, does Tucker really even need the money? Is it that big of a gain for him? But I also have to admit to you guys that I did space out for a brief moment <laughs> during that scene, and I thought that I heard Tucker say something like, Oh, that means that I'll be a silent partner? Is Did I imagine that or did that happen? Here's where I really need your help. I'm sorry. I Sometimes I do miss things. And I did space out for just a brief moment and I missed out. I understand that Tucker's getting at a portion of the sale of Beauty of Nature, but does that mean that he's going to have some kind of silent control in the company? If you guys could somehow leave me a message <laughs> and let me know about that. I would really appreciate it. I'm sure it will be revealed um, and played more upon within the coming weeks, but I want to know now, so <laughs> please let me know. I think that the larger issue that's annoying me with Tucker is the fact that he just can't seem to be honest with Ashley. And he just can't seem to get his priorities straight. He finally opened up to her this week and told her that the entire feud with Sophia was a ruse, which didn't make her happy, it didn't help the situation, but what really digs at Ashley is the fact that Tucker continues to go after Beauty of Nature when she is, has asked him repeatedly not to. Hey, if you could maybe not buy a competing company, that would, I would really appreciate that, babe. <laughs> and why? Why does he insist on going after this when it's going to hurt him in the long run. And what's, like, what is, what is so special about beauty of nature that he has to risk his marriage in order to get it? It's, it's annoying to me. It makes me completely re like, it makes me question Tucker. I like Tucker. I like Tucker and Ashley. And it's making me re-question his character. I thought that he was ready for a serious relationship. I mean, he's never been married before. Ashley seems to be the one for him. And he even had, to, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Well, well, no, he had a conversation with Harmony later on in the week. And he said to her something like, well, if why is it that the person I love so much in the world, it hurts me so bad to get her, you know, to think that I've disappointed her, you know, in reference to Ashley. And it's like, because you know you're wrong. That's your conscience talking, Tucker. If you're feeling guilty about what's going on with Ashley, that's your conscience talking in the back of your mind, telling you that you're doing a bad thing and that you need to start backing out and prioritizing your life. Don't risk your relationship with your wife to get a freaking company. It's immature. It's unevolved. <laughs> And I expect more <laughs> from Tucker. <laughs> what really concerns me, though, <laughs> well, it all concerns me, but I'm wondering, just based on that little moment at the bar between Tucker and Harmony, wherein he was opening up to her, <sighs> I'm wondering if this entire argument with Ashley is going to end up pushing him back into the arms of an old 
flame. It's funny that Neil and Sophia thought that maybe they were going to cover up their kiss that happened last week and maybe pretend like it wouldn't it hadn't happened and maybe no one would notice because Sophia knew right away <laughs> that something had happened. She did not miss a beat. <laughs> they go to the coffee house. Sophia and Neil are at the coffee house. The next day, Harmony walks in and Sophia knew. I think Sophia knew before then. I, I, Neil had come home late that night. She knew her man was off with another woman. A, a woman knows. And Sophia picked up on it right away. And I gotta give respect her for that. At the same time, though, I hate how pathetic this was making Sophia look. She is grasping at straws just to hang on to her man, and it makes her look really really pathetic. It's it, it, She's just trying so hard to show them as, you know, this, um, like, publicly solid couple when everybody knows, not only internally, but uh, even, like, Lily knows and Devon kind of knows, everybody kind of knows that Neil and Sophia aren't really in love. And so it just, it really, really does make her look bad, especially when she loves him. I think she has really always had uh, really strong feelings for Neil, and she wants to hold on to him. She wants to keep her family together, and in this kind of last-ditch effort to do so, she ends up booking a room at the athletic club to have sexy time with Neil. And Neil is, just, I think, feeling so guilty about what happened with Harmony, feeling like he betrayed his wife, he betrayed his family, he betrayed his word, and as we know, Neil is a man of his word, so he kind of goes along with it. And it's like they're both, like, I think Neil is just trying to sex his way into loving her. I can just imagine him having sex with her going, or, or just thinking, I love her, I love her, I love her, I love her. You know, just trying to convince him that, himself that, that he does. And it, it's, it's not true. Neil doesn't really love Sophia. He loves Harmony. And Harmony loves Neil at the coffee house. This week when they ran into each other, it was so awkward. It was so awkward. And Sarge is kind of hanging out in the wings. Harmony pretty much just grabs him by his arm, rushes him over to Neil and Sophia's table, and starts acting like he's her new beau. I felt so bad for Sarge. <laughs> she totally used him. And he did her a favor by not blowing the whole thing. I mean, she's being so overt about it. And then, after it was all over, she was so mean to Sarge. She used him and then kind of threw him away. She was like, I'm going to let you pretend to be my boyfriend in front of the guy that I really like. And then as soon as they're gone, she's like, screw you, Sarge. And just pushes him off to the side. And I felt so, so bad for him. Like, don't don't treat him like crap. He didn't do anything to you. He can't, you can't just be nice to him when you need him and then toss him aside when you don't. Oh, I felt bad for him, but I feel bad for everyone in this situation. It's so, it's, I really genuinely feel bad for everyone in this situation. It has created awkwardness within the family now. Anytime there's a little family gathering, which is typically centered around Devon and Devon's studio now, it's so weird. And especially since Devon's recording studio has now officially turned into Devon's dance hall. <laughs> We've seen more dancing in Devon's studio than mixing of music. It's kind of funny. They keep putting on Angelina's music, and what do you know? There are couples there, and people just naturally start to dance. And there was this awkward moment when they're all there. Devon's there with Roxy, which, by the way, so nice to see Roxy. I really love her. I want to see more of her. I think that she has total potential, and she could really bring some spice into the situation. And, um, anyway, so they're dancing. <laughs> Tangented. They're dancing, and then Ashley and Tucker, they're dancing, and what do you know? Neil and Harmony are just two little lone pegs. And Devon suggests, come on, you guys, why don't you two start dancing? Why not kick it up? And it's so strange for them. 
it's they just had this moment they're trying to deny what's going on and now all of a sudden they're being forced to dance with each other and it was so weird oh. later Devon um, decides to go out and take everybody out for dinner and Harmony has to dodge she just decides she doesn't want to be around Neil she is a former addict and she has learned that you, you, when there's something that you want that you can't or shouldn't have, you just need to keep it out of your life. Keep it away from me. You can't, you can't just do a little bit of crack when you're an addict. You have to be fully into it. So she wants to stay away from Neil so that she's not tempted to continue to try to want to be with him or to end up being the cause of breaking up his marriage. That's not what she wants to do. And I, and then of course Neil doesn't want it to be awkward either. Everyone's picking up on it. He ends up going to this dinner with Devon and Sophia and the rest of everybody but Harmony and the entire time he's thinking about Harmony. And it was so obvious that his mind was not there. It was so obvious where his mind was. And I was so proud of him finally that he went to go see Harmony at at home at Catherine's house. And which, by the way, Catherine totally picked up on what was going on between Neil and Harmony. K K Neil was there just to make it look like he was coming to see Catherine, and she knew right away that he wasn't. I love Catherine's role now. She's j she's just the person that comes in and says, you don't fool me. <laughs> Whether it's Tucker and the Sophia feud, or Chloe and Kevin, or Neil and Harmony, Catherine just comes in and she's just like, you don't fool me. <laughs> That's her new role. But she leaves Neil and Harmony alone to talk and I'm so glad that they talked because I was nervous that they were just going to ignore it. At first it seemed like they were never going to address it and they were just going to go try to go about their lives and pretend like it didn't happen and they actually did talk to each other about what they were feeling and they were completely honest and completely open and <sighs> it was so it laid the situation out for what it really was. I'm glad that everyone's aware. Harmony told Neil, look, I kissed you and I liked it. And I want to kiss you some more. I'm really, really into you. And Neil said essentially the same thing back to her. I really liked it too. So at least there was an acknowledgement that they were both into it. Now, of course, they're not going to end up acting on it. There was also this acknowledgement that they can't act on their feelings. Neil has this family. He has this child. If they were both single, hell, if it were six months ago, if it were a year ago, if it were three months ago, it may have been a different story. But now Neil is locked in to this life and they can't pursue what they feel. But... At the same time, I'm just so glad that they acknowledged what they do feel. And I thought that there was such an interesting little moment where they were kind of arguing back and forth and Harmony was just letting him know that she needs to stay away from him. And she kind of like tries to walk away and Neil grabs her arm and she turned back and looked at him and like she was like licking her lips just at his touch. He grabbed her arm in this very just forceful, but like it's like it was like the second his his skin touched hers, it was she was salivating and she started licking her lips. <laughs> it was such a subtle thing that I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but it was such a subtle moment that added so much to the scene. It re like you could feel the hunger. <laughs> Harmony wanted to devour Neil, and Neil wanted it too. Neil is such a stuffed shirt. He's been such a stuffed shirt since probably the day that Drew died, or maybe at some point after he started being a drunk. He has to be all reasonable. He's talking all rational. He has to try to 
uh, just be logical about the entire situation and say that they need to keep their distance from each other. But Harmony is an emotional person and it's just so interesting to see them crashing together. I love it. That's just, that's the that's the in summary, I love it. I am I feel like Neil and Harmony belong together. I love them together in a way that I have not loved Neil with anyone other than Drew. Ugh, it's so good. I'm on board. I'm like I'm on board team uh Narmony. <laughs> What is that? Is that what we're gonna call him? Narmony? <laughs> Neil and Harmony? Whatever it is, I'm on this team. I'm so into it. I feel like YNR is playing it just right. They're giving me just enough to make me want it. And I, I you know, I, I felt like, well, we don't really have to go there. It was just a kiss. They haven't made, they haven't even made love yet. It was one kiss and look at me. <laughs> I'm all over myself. Uh, so I hope you guys don't mind. I'm going to be drooling over this probably forever. <laughs> it's so, so hot. And then at the same time, I, I see Sophia and Neil with Moses playing with him, enjoying him growing up and looking at their little family. And I feel terrible for Sophia. So it's, it's, I feel the pull. Like I said, Wyatt is playing it exactly right. I don't know what Neil should do. I understand the argument for him needing to stay with his family. At the same time, I want Neil and Harmony. So, I don't know. You, it's time for you guys to weigh in. Let me know what you think. Should Neil pursue his passion or should he stay with his family? Leave me a comment and let me know. Daniel's custody hearing was this week and he was denied denied his position for full petition for full custody of Lucy which I guess in retrospect is not particularly um, surprising it would be way less dramatic if Daisy wasn't in the picture so she still retains custody of the child shared custody with Daniel but the whole thing is under six month review. The judge declared that in six months they can review the situation, which I think is better than nothing. I and mean, maybe, <coughs> excuse me, maybe the judge didn't feel like Daniel was ready to be the full time parent right now, but he didn't close it off. He didn't close the book. So I felt like, well, at least that's something. Be happy that Daniel has shared custody and that you can still see Lucy a little bit. So I thought it was pretty, you know, I thought that, that was at least pretty good. Um, now, as a result of the negative, the perceived negative outcome, Daniel runs off. He decides he has some art things he needs to take care of, so he's going to go collect his thoughts and come back, I don't know, in a couple of weeks, a month. I was a little disappointed that he just decided that he was going to run off, but I guess that's his way of coping with things. Phyllis has her own way of coping with things, which included firing Ricky from Restless Style. She saw through him right away. She knew that the whole Lucy disappearing for five minutes thing wasn't a coincidence, and it wasn't a coincidence that Ricky just happened to be there to bring her back. Uh, she knew right away that he was behind that, and she just fired him on the spot, which is pretty much the equivalent to poking a snake. He's gonna turn around and bite you. And I'm really loving what is gearing up to be Phyllis versus Ricky. It's, it's, it's good, it's juicy. And I'm really, really excited about what Ricky's next move is gonna be. And according to him, he wants to write a tell-all book, a full-on book about Phyllis and all of her exploits, which I think is going to be so amazing. There are so many, <laughs> so many. I would love to, I would love for this book to come out. I would love for it to coincide with some flashbacks. I would love for us to go back to the 90s when Phyllis was nuts. And I would love to see all of that come out. I mean, it, it, it needs to. It's going to be entertaining for us, not to mention a little bit of comeuppance for her, because as much as I love Phyllis, she writes about 
everyone else. She is no holds barred about putting everybody else's problems in black and white. And now it's time for somebody to do the same thing to her. And I'm glad it's going to be Ricky. I absolutely love it. I think this is going to be very, very entertaining. And I hope that they start getting their ball rolling on this soon. Gosh, Ricky is just so good. He's just such a good, bad character. I'm really enjoying him. And don't get me wrong, I, it's not an anti-Phyllis thing. I really do still like and enjoy Phyllis. I just think she has a little, she's, she's a little nuts. <laughs> and she has, she has something coming back to her, I think. I'm, I, it bothers me a little that the way she blames everyone else for things rather than looking at herself. I, I hate the way she's blaming Avery for what happened with Lucy. Yes, Avery was the one who got Daisy out of jail, but as one of you guys very aptly pointed out to me last week, Phyllis was the one that brought Daisy back into the picture in the first place. And as Phyllis and Avery are having this argument, Avery brought that up to Phyllis, and she immediately closed off. Phyllis was like, what? You're saying this is my fault? This is my fault? This is my fault? In the way that she repeats everything that she says <laughs> at least two times. And I, I just felt it was such a telling moment. And it was such so indicative of Phyllis's personality. As soon as Avery brought up the truth, which is that Phyllis set this chain into motion, Phyllis shuts down and it's the equivalent of her just putting her hands over her ears and being like, I can't hear you, la 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 la. It's exactly what she did. Rather than look, take a look in the mirror and realize that she played a part in this too. Everybody around her, Michael, Lauren, Nick, they were all telling her, leave it alone. Don't bring Daisy back. You're opening up a can of worms that you don't want to open. And she didn't listen. And it resulted in this. So, I don't know. It just, it, she's, she's, I don't know. She's getting a little bit of what she paid for, I have to say. I'm honestly kind of, uh, I'm surprised with the way that Phyllis is treating Avery because I thought that they were making some progress. There were, it wasn't even two weeks ago that they were sitting on the couch talking about Phyllis's problems with Nick and Avery was listening and really trying and Avery opened up to Michael this week and said, you know, I came into town because I wanted to try to reconnect with my sister, which I don't know if I totally believe. In some ways it did seem like Avery was going right after Nick, but I don't know, I guess that remains to be seen. Still, I, I just, I, I felt like sympathy for Avery. Everybody in town is hating on her. They're treating her like crap. I mean, especially Phyllis. I guess maybe it is only Phyllis. But, oh, Lauren treated her, treated her poorly this week, too. But every time they say something mean to her, she just, just, she doesn't respond. She doesn't engage. She just says, I'm working on it. You know, she's going to try. She wants Lucy to be with Daniel just as much as anybody else, I think, in part to redeem herself. So I feel bad for everybody being down on Avery, and I wish they would lighten up. I'm frankly surprised that Phyllis hasn't flipped out yet about the fact that Michael and Avery are getting close. Phyllis is so territorial. I would be, I'm, I'm shocked that she's not claiming ownership of Michael and telling Avery that she can't be friends with Michael because he's her friend. It's so childish and so immature. But, uh, <laughs> speaking of child, <laughs> Phyllis is pregnant. She's totally pregnant, you guys. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> Phyllis went to Glowworm this week, and it unfolded so quickly. Like, she was sitting in a booth, and Jeff comes by with calamari and offers her some free food, and she's immediately ill. She's covering her mouth. I can't, I can't. And she, I think, in that moment realizes that, wow, food aversion, I could be pregnant. So they, Nick and Phyllis go to the store. She buys a pregnancy test that he doesn't see. And when they get home, she reveals it to him that she thinks, eh, I might need to take this pregnancy test here. And Nick's face was so good. He looked so shocked. Poor Nick. It's as if Nick doesn't realize how babies are made. <laughs> really? You mean that's how it happens? Hmm. <laughs> They've been doing it a lot lately. But I, you gotta give it to Nick. He, he, he knows how to make a baby. <laughs> and he, 
immediately felt at, the, at this news, even at the possibility that she might be pregnant, he felt that he wanted to marry her. He, as they're sitting there waiting for the tests to be done, he tells her, I want to marry you. Whether you're pregnant or not, I think we make a good team. We should get married. Personally, I think no. I think Nick and Phyllis should not get married. I think that Nick operates best. You gotta learn how to manage your man, is the thing. And I think <laughs> Nick operates best when he is wanting something, when you don't give him what he wants. As soon as Nick gets what he wants, he wants something else. Which is not an altogether uncommon feeling to have, but that's exactly how he is. So if Phyllis wants to hang on to Nick and hang on to him for good this time, I think she shouldn't remarry him, personally. But at the same time, she is pregnant. She is going to need some support. I, I think it's a good thing. How do you guys feel about Phyllis's pregnancy? I'm for it because I feel like it's gonna give Phyllis her own child to worry about now. She's spent so much time agonizing over the loss of Lucy that this will give her her own child. It will help kind of feel that instinct. It doesn't make her love for Lucy go away. It doesn't make the situation with Daisy any less tolerable, tolerable but at least it gives Phyllis some place to put that maternal love, which for some reason um, she hasn't really done, she hasn't really put on to Summer lately. But at, at the same time, I honestly would not be at all surprised if Phyllis had done this on purpose, if this wasn't her goal all along, or maybe even subconsciously, like subconsciously on purpose, but I think she might have had this one up her sleeve. This might have been something that, <laughs> I mean, by the time you get to be, by the time at least you even start to, I don't know, I figured it out really early how babies were made. <laughs> I don't know, at a certain point, it's, it's, uh, you know, if you didn't want the accident, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. I think Phyllis maybe did it subconsciously on purpose. Nikki certainly cannot say that Victor did not try to get her to come back to him. He went over to the Abbott Mansion this week, he tried to persuade Nikki to come back to the ranch with him, and she turned him down flat. She pushed him right away. So you can't say that Victor hasn't tried to repair the relationship. Victor clearly still wants Nikki. At this point in time, Nikki is the one who's thrown up resistance because as soon as Victor got home, back to the ranch, he had a floral delivery there from Genevieve, which he promptly threw in the trash. <laughs> I think that says it all. That says it all about how Victor feels. It says it all about what his motives surrounding Genevieve are. So here we have, yet again, Victor and Nikki, probably both longing to be together but forces pulling them apart. It never ends. <laughs> but actually, Nikki has some bigger problems to deal with at this point. She's trying to push forward with this relationship to Jack. And even Jack said, after Victor came over to the house, he said, maybe this isn't our time. I, you know, Nick, <laughs> Jack does not need to be hurt at this point. He's got enough going on. He actually decided this week that he's not going to go through with the with the risky experimental surgery. He's going to connect with Sarge and continue with his physical therapy. And so I think he's got a lot going on in his life right now to where he doesn't need to be involved with someone who's not really into him. But, 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 I, and I don't know how it's all going to factor in, but at the same time, Kyle's back. Kyle conveniently comes back into the picture aged. <laughs> he went from being a little boy uh, interested in hockey <laughs> to now he's a, a badass dude in a black leather jacket. From hockey to black leather jacket he has gone. And from, what, 13 to about... 35? He's also gone? Kyle looks to be about 35 <laughs> now. He's got a receding hairline, for crying out loud. They way aged him. He looks like he should be on a motorcycle. He's a completely different kid. He's got a chip on his shoulder. He realizes that Nikki 
was the one who killed his mother and he hates her for it. And furthermore, he hates that his father is is involved with her. I don't know, is Nikki living with Jack? I don't, didn't really get that idea. Is she, is she living at the athletic club or with Jack? I'm not sure. But either way, Kyle is not happy about it. He's not afraid to make a big stink about it and he's certainly not going to be anywhere near her. He's going to do everything he can do to not only sabotage Nikki and Jack's relationship but to get back at Jack. He can't believe that he's seeing Nikki, that Jack would let Nikki into his life after she killed Diane. So Kyle's master plan, which I love, is he immediately goes to Victor and tells him, hey, you had given me an invitation to move into the ranch. Is that still good? Because I'd really, really like to do that, which is going to cause a major rift between, more major rift, as if there could be more, between Victor and Jack. Jack is not going to like the fact that his son is staying out at the ranch with Victor, while Victor will be salivating and loving every moment of it. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing it. And I'm cur I can't remember who it was that YNR is also aging. Is it Summer? Someone else is also going to be getting aged because I'm trying to trying to figure out now who, I think maybe we should take bets. Who do you think is going to be the first person that Kyle will sleep with in Genoa City? Let's take our bets now. Leave me a comment and let me know who your money is on. Billy and Victoria's adoption of little Johnny Abbott has gone through. Josie had a moment of doubt. Chelsea saw Billy and Victoria a couple of times this week out in public. It was weird and she was starting to wonder if maybe she was making the wrong decision but at the end of the day she decided to stay true to her word and she told the judge that she wanted Billy and Victoria to have custody of the little little child and she felt like they were going to be able to give him a home that she wasn't able to. So the judge ruled in Billy and Victoria's favor. They are now officially parents. So good for them. I am glad for them. They decided to go ahead and immediately have a christening and a party and I'm glad that they're happy. I'm glad that Chelsea kept her word. I was getting tired of the whole storyline. So Billy and Victoria, have your kid. Let's just move on to something else. <laughs> you know, and I think really probably what YNR is realizing is that the far more interesting story is the triangle that's developing between Chelsea and Adam and Sharon. Adam has been there for Chelsea the entire time throughout this, well, not the entire time, but toward the end of this Billy and Victoria mess. He saved her life. He saved the child's life. He's always there. He's always been an ear. He was sitting behind her in the courtroom. He, they're obviously becoming very close, and she needs that right now. I'm Again, I'm also glad for her, and I'm glad for him to some extent she's there for him when he needs somebody to lean on everybody in genoa city has turned their back on him namely sharon and now he has somebody that he can confide in they're going out they're being seen around town together they ran into billy and victoria at glowworm at the after christening party and again it was awkward Chelsea's trying to decide whether or not she should even stay in town. Billy and Victoria offered to give her money or to set her up wherever she wanted to go in the world. And you could tell Billy and Victoria were hoping she would choose someplace far, far away. But she's trying to decide if that's what she wants. They've also promised her that she would be able to have a role in her child's life if that's what she wants. So at this point, she's trying to decide whether or not she wants to continue having these weird run-ins with everyone or whether she just wants to go away. And I think that Adam also identifies with that. It was last week or the week before that Ashley was telling him, why don't you just leave town? Just get out of here. We don't want to see you anymore. So they're in the same boat in a lot of ways. And it is a two-way street. I think that Chelsea is helping Adam to work through some of his problems as well. So while they were at Glowworm running into Billy and Victoria, Sharon was also there at a table by herself working on business. She's chosen to let business fill the void 
of what has been left behind by Adam, what has been taken from her, you know, with the absence of Adam in her life. And Sharon doesn't miss a beat. As soon as Adam and Chelsea walk through the door and sit down, Sharon makes a beeline over there to tell Adam happy birthday. She wants to let him know that she hasn't forgotten. And it was, it was weird because Chelsea didn't know that it was Adam's birthday and she immediately was saying, happy birthday, I had no idea. And I think that made Sharon feel good. I think Sharon wanted in some ways to prove that she knows Adam, that she knows him better. Oh, he didn't tell you that it was his birthday, did did he? I mean, she doesn't, do, she doesn't act like that overtly, but somehow I can't help but think in the back of her mind that she's jealous of Adam and Chelsea and that that's what she was thinking, that she in a way wanted to stick, she wanted to tell him happy birthday to have an inroad with him, but I think at the same time she wanted to establish herself as an important woman in Adam's life to Chelsea. So it was an interesting run-in and as soon as Adam and Chelsea got back to the hotel, the athletic club, Chelsea decided that she wants, I think she wants to be a new important woman in, Chel in, in Adam's life and establish herself as that. So she calls room service and has a cake delivered and it's very cute between them. They're just talking and, you know, Adam's kind of saying, it's been a long time since I have decided to celebrate my birthday and now here I'm kind of excited about it. And it was very cute. And Sharon... <laughs> She did enough. She went up to him and told him happy birthday. But beyond that, Sharon decides that that's not enough. She goes to his room to slip a birthday card under the door. Clearly she's coming back around. She's she's seeing that he really is changed. I guess all of this was her way of just seeing if it if what happened at the farm was true, if it was genuine, if it was going to stick, if the good Adam was going to stick around. Maybe that's what this all has been. And now she's starting to realize that, first of all, he has actually changed. Second of all, oh, he's kind of moving on. So I better move, I better get, get on this. I need to get him back. I think that's exactly what she's doing. She goes to slip this card under the door to double follow up on his birthday wish. And at, it was at the exact moment that he's making a move on Chelsea or he's moving on with Chelsea. I, I, I don't know who exactly initiated the kiss, but they started kissing. It was just, it was almost really mutual, to be honest. It was kind of this moment where they just both in sync stepped in and went for a smooch. <laughs> ah, I guess it was, it was going to happen sooner or later, whether I like it or not. And I will admit, I, I did not dislike the kiss between Adam and Chelsea as much as I thought that I was going to. It wasn't an altogether unpleasant experience. I mean, Adam is hot and I do enjoy him in sexual situations and it would be really good if for his birthday we could get him into his birthday suit. Okay, you guys. That is going to just about do it for your pal Allie for this week. I don't think there's... Well, I guess there's a couple other tiny things. I did hear uh, from my friend Gina that Weiner is going to be re-recording their opening. Finally! <laughs> it has been... I think... I looked it up. I think it's been 10 years since they re-recorded the opening sequence. And it's it's been too long. And I kind of understand the point where there's so much fluctuation within the cast that they don't want to just give everybody a, uh, what do you call it, a title card or a credit, whatever, whatever it is. They don't want to include everybody in the opening sequence because things change so often. There have been major characters that they just decide to go and kill and then all of a sudden they have to go and rearrange that opening sequence. And for being as, you know, fast-paced of a recording schedule as I'm sure that they are, I can see why they have hesitated to do that. But I don't know why they didn't just can't they just think outside of the, the box a little bit? Just show some different scenes. Just show different scenes and then put act, the actors' names below them. It doesn't have to be that complicated, but I'm looking forward to seeing what it is that they've done. I never, I don't know. Do you guys have a favorite 
opening sequence that you've seen. I mean, we have had the classic um, white background and the red text and the kind of black and white silhouettes that I think kind of start. Well, it was a, like a drawing. It was sketches at first of the actors, I believe. And then it kind of evolved. I remember in the 90s, they went to that red satin background and everybody's, you know, faces um, in, in the foreground. And then, you know, what we have now. I, there, I mean, I guess those have been the major overhauls. I'm I'm curious to see what they do visually with the new opening credits. So we'll see. We'll have to keep our eyes out for that. It's probably not going to be another couple of months because from what I heard, they're just uh, filming them now. So it may be another month before we see that. But I'm looking forward to it. It will be exciting. <laughs> Okay, th now that's really it. I'm really done. <laughs> I hope that you guys are having a good week and that you leave me a comment and let me know what you're thinking about all of the awesomeness that is our favorite show. I'm looking forward to reading and responding as always. Okay, everybody, have an awesome week next week. I love you so much and I will see you next time. Okay, Mwah. bye.